Howdy, everybody. It's Sunday, September 19th, 2010. And let me remove this because this is Day 9 Daily number 182. I'm in a good mood because tomorrow is Fun Day Monday. Oh, doesn't everyone love Monday? Let me tell you what's going to be special about tomorrow's Monday as opposed to a regular, ordinary old Monday. Tomorrow, I'm going to be reviewing the No Queen Zerg strategies that you guys submitted. For any of you who are unfamiliar with this, send an email to day9monday at gmail.com with a replay of you playing Zerg without any queens at all, preferably winning, unless it was like a really dramatic game that you barely lost. If it's like a four minute game where you didn't go queens and got smashed, then I'm probably not going to do it. But just include like a two sentence description of what happened in it. Uh, exactly two, no more, no less, just two sentences that are brief, um, and of course the replay attached. And there's a chance it will be reviewed tomorrow, because we're going to be checking out some of those to see what creativity lies in the StarCraft community. And uh, I'm going to make another similar kind of announcement on Monday about what cool stuff is happening the following week. Mm, probably can't see it, I'm rubbing my tummy off camera, because all oh, user submitted things taste so good. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of a story of what it's like from the eyes of someone who takes StarCraft real seriously. Not necessarily me specifically is who I'm referring to, but this has happened to many of my buddies who, you know, were big hardcore Brood War players and, you know, to go to tournaments and all this good jazz. It's always a little rough when you're playing a practice game. Uh, you know, you're, well, you're playing on ladder because you're actually trying to get a real sense of how your strategy works, but you're just trying something out, you know? You're just trying something. Maybe you were chatting with someone during the game. Maybe you weren't feeling as focused. Maybe it was your first game of the day and you weren't quite so warmed up. And you play someone who, you know, you don't know the person. Person wins. You say, GG. He says, uh, GG. You leave. Easy peasy. And then 45 seconds later, it's posted on like 10 replay sites. Like, oh, look at me. I'm doing a great job of killing this good player. And all the comments are like, I'm good players. Play like shit. He's horrible and all that misery. Um, that's that's a, that's always a rough thing to deal with. Because in, the, in the player, it was just like, well, come on. I had wanted to just try a thing out. You know, it's it stings. It's painful. You're not allowed to try things out. That's why people smurf so much in Brood War. And why people um, kind of are irritated that they can't smurf in StarCraft 2. Uh, one such player, for instance, uh, is going to be the topic of today's discussion. In Control, who played my friend, uh, Tristan. <laughs> so I'm reviewing one of his replays. And the reason I told that little story is because Tristan played uh, In Control on the ladder. In this game that we're about to see. And I don't really know if In Control was maybe really trying to do his best or all this stuff. But... We're going to review it anyways, and um, I just don't want anyone jumping down his throat and being like, Wow, are you a coach? Oh my god, and all freaking out and all this terrible stuff. Because in control is a super good player. Actually, he's really good. Because, I mean, there's like good people who you see online, you see them win, and you see them play well. Um, but then there is the people who you actually sit behind at a tournament, and you can actually see the way that they hold their hands and the way they play. And in control is really good. So, ha ha ha, in control. You are going to be one of the topics of today's discussion. This is my friend Tristan. He's the red probes down here at the bottom. Uh, and this is in control, who is at the left as the blue Protoss pieces. And I specifically am really interested in this PvP. Um, first of all, because it's my friend Tristan. Yeah, Tristan warping in a pylon like an absolute genius. And in control, warping in a pylon, whatever. So, uh, one, of course, main reason Tristan is the subject of this replay, but also because my friend Tristan is someone who I would call uh, casually competitive. He doesn't, like, try to get in and get tickets at MLG or something like that. Or, you know, in Torch's case, down a whole bunch of money to go to South Korea to potentially enter the GSL and then qualify like a huge baller. No, he just plays on the ladder, likes to look at uh, strategies that good people are doing, and tries to learn from them and tries to make them his own. Um... And as a result, he kind of thinks about things in a way that I, I think is pretty unique. Uh, a lot of people who do this, who are in this casually competitive boat, will really just try a variety of stuff. A lot of it comes from actually bumpiness in play, um, where they have a few really good aspects and a few slightly um, weaker aspects. And as a result, something weird happens that ends up looking pretty damn nice. Like, for instance, already... Um, Tristan's doing something that 
if I had initially seen this, this was a first time viewing of this kind of technique, I would kind of go, what the heck's going on? You know, we went gateway, or we pylon, gateway, pylon, and no gas, and then look, there's another gateway going down, like, right away. Obviously, it's a little late, it's not as perfect as it could be, but, um... You know, this is looking a little unusual. Now, to, to, to be fair, this isn't the first time I've seen this sort of strategy in PvP. Adele Scott to the Frenchman has been doing this, and it's pretty cool. Uh, and, of course, I uh, have been known for mispronouncing that. And this this is a very odd-looking opening, to be entirely honest. And, I you know, I want to stop in this game and not talk so much about this strategy, but also talk about a lot of the reason why... Um, the fact that this is PvP excites me, because PvP uh, has been labeled as the matchup where you go 4-gate, and if you don't go 4-gate, have fun losing. You know, that's kind of the way that people are thinking about it nowadays, and honestly there's a lot of truth to that. 4-warp-gate um, is one of those strategies that really makes you throw options out, because it beats so much stuff. And the reason is because 4-gate is a very simple macro build. It's a build where you just get 4 warp gates, you make a lot of stuff, and then you can kill almost anything because you just have so much stuff so fast. That's really about as deep as you need to think about 4-gate. So with almost every build, the big question is, am I going to have enough stuff to kill a 4-gate? And that sort of thing. Now, In Control is doing the very standard build. He is going uh, Gateway, Gas, Core. Very, very simple. Um, th this is, the reason this is like the base skeleton is because from this you can go for uh, Robo Builds, you can go for... Um, for warp gate, obviously, you can do some other tech openings. But I want I want you to note just a handful of things. For any of you who um, say like me, two gate a lot in PVZ, you'll note that you're obviously getting fewer zealots, but you're getting this gas a lot earlier. And I mean, just looking at this timing kind of made my eyes go, oh, like. Look at this, second zealot. Could start now. Come on, Tristan. Tristan! Tristan, make a zealot. Oh, he accidentally queued it in here, canceled it, and then built it there. But I'm noticing that pylons aren't getting blocked. We're still making a good amount of probes. Huh. Wow. And we could even build another pylon now and continue to make units. So in a sense, it's like we eventually get a good number of zealots. We eventually get a pretty damn good solid number of zealots into his base. And as we can see, In Control is going to be getting behind on the gateway production. Because this awkwardly, sort of weirdly timed second gate... I mean, personally, I would almost always want to go 12 gate, 13 gate. But as we see, if we delay it a little bit, we can get more probes, and we don't get huge amounts of zealots fast. We get a lot of zealots a little bit later, and we get gas. It's kind of it's kind of funky. It's kind of a funky little rearrangement. Now, I also want to back up, because we were looking at the base while all this was happening. But, um... In Control is getting his Stalker out really quickly. Here comes the Zealot. These aren't terribly close positions, so it makes me feel like I can do this on almost any map. But look, going straight for the probes now in... In PvP, in the original StarCraft, this was a huge deal. Starting to lose some of these probes uh, to an initial Zealot. And look, there's two probes down, three probes. Zealots kill probes so quickly. And as we can see, ended up getting four or five. I actually lost count at the very end. Um, but now Tristan is finally starting to back off. And if we go to this unit counting station, we can see that Tristan is ahead by four probes. Wow. Obviously, something like Chrono Boosting Workers uh, could potentially be good. But, you know, I think Chrono Boost is one of these un underused um, thought processes. People not really getting that creative with their Chrono Boost. I mean, you get a player like Huck, who almost exclusively Chrono Boosts his probes early on. And he's good! He's really good. He's, like, number one on the ladder right now. I think he just passed Phoenix, or Phoenix is still number one. Either way, he's, like, a 2,000-rated Protoss. It's not bad to constantly chrono boost your probes. It really can't be bad. But players like Tester, and in this game I'm seeing Tristan saving up his chrono boost, can do creative things like suddenly really get some upgrade ultra, ultra fast. Now in control is doing the usual expected response, which is to try to do some small counterattack with this Stalker, because he knows his opponent is delayed on Stalker, as we can clearly see. Also in control is, uh, on, uh, hasn't started warp gate yet. I wouldn't, um, gripe on that too much. I actually think he should have gotten it, but I don't think it's, like, some sort of ultra-sophisticated thing. But hey, look! 
Stalker is getting Chrono Boosted still. Good pro production going on. And there's the Chrono Boost on the Warp Gate. And this is something that I've seen Kiwi Kaki do a lot as well. Saving Chrono Boost and then double Chrono Boosting a lot of Stalkers really fast to just go crazy with the aggression. Um, but yeah, still big thing I'm noting. Tristan has remained four probes ahead because he hasn't been missing up on his probe production. Now, in, tri uh, in in control spot, he was behind early on, took a little bit of damage, so he is going for warp gate, or, or he yeah, there's for warp gate, going down, chrono boosting that. It's it's a pretty reasonable uh, s response. If you see your opponent going some sort of very early two gate and being aggressive with it, then uh, and it did damage. Your instinct is to overcompensate for your early losses to just get way more stuff. And as we can see. Uh, Tristan, who's just been gently pumping off the two gates he got right off the bat, is quite a ways ahead in the unit count. We can even see four Stalkers and five Zealots versus four Stalkers and one Zealot. And Tristan pokes in and just safely pulls back. Well, okay, don't skirt by the edge, because then that can happen and that's no good. But just gently pulling back by the edge, and this is the thing that really made me kind of go, huh. Now that's interesting. This is very similar to what Adele Scott did against Huck. Uh, but this game ends up being a little bit, uh, a teensy bit longer, a teensy bit longer. We do see the Nexus going down right now, a lot of Warp Gates going down, Second Gas going down as well. And we do see In Control is now getting his four Warp Gates out right now, and there is a Robotics Facility going down. Did he scout anything? I, I was a little curious about this move, about him throwing down the Robo Bay. Anytime there's something that you can't explain, just feel free to rewind. And there's the Robo Bay going down. Obviously, we can't support four warp gates and this fast robotics facility. But, you know, um, in In Control's defense, um, this is something that a lot of Protoss people have been trying to do. To try to do what I call peeling the matchup open. Because if everyone's four warp gating, it's kind of locked. You want to do something to sort of peel it open into a new realm of possibility. So, what a lot of players have been doing is just getting four warp gates. Anyways, but then not really using them and then building the robotics facility and that sounds like the dumbest thing possible It sounds stupid, but it has a certain kind of logic to it Because theoretically if the only way to hold off a four gate is for me to also go for warp gate Then if I never push out and just do the good old defenders advantage Yeah, awesome. It's gonna work out perfectly so I'm going to move back, oopsie daisies, move back to the game. So that's kind of the logic that people have been doing, but we're seeing uh, some smart decision making with that Chrono Boost, doing this style Tristan's doing. Obviously getting a lot of units, but also Chrono Boosting the Warp Gates, being very, 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 very active about doing that. We see a Forge coming down, we'll come back to this in a little bit. Um, and again, a lot of this is similar to the Huck vs. Adele Scott opening, but I do like the little bit of uh, aggression that Tristan did with those early Zealots to kill off a lot of the probes. Very good stuff. Expansion going down. Forge up. Um, I like that it's four gates here instead of uh, a lot of times people will make five. But you can't exactly support five if you're trying to do other things as well. And I think that this Forge is a very nice touch to throw down a Photon Cannon. I think placement-wise we should actually have it tight to the ramp with the other pylon tight to the ramp as well. But we want to make sure we have detection so we don't lose to something cheesy. I mean, remember, we're, we're still doing something a little bit stable, just doing a little push into an early expand. So you want to make sure you can hold off any sort of DT action. Um, but a Robo feels a little bit too costly. This is just money, this is just money, and we can get an upgrade, which will bolster our already pretty large force. Um, and in control is doing something, again, quite reasonable, going for a very fast robotics bay. And this is something that is specific to Metalopolis, I think, as a map, is that a lot of times you'll see many players do this, where they get a pretty damn big force up, or pretty big production capacity up, and they'll just suddenly stop producing and throw down an expansion. This is very, very common on Metalopolis, because it's actually quite easy to defend with this cliff if you have a Colossus up. It's very, very, very easy to defend. Uh, or really with pretty much anything, it's relatively easy to defend. Now, in the Huck vs. Adele game, what we saw was um, 
uh, in in that game, because it's pretty important to compare these two, that Huck was in this position and Adele was in this spot. And Adele had taken his natural expansion and Huck was just trying to ram a bunch of units down his throat, getting the Colossus, making a whole lot of stalkers and zealots to boost the Colossus. The Colossus was the main part. And Adele was in big defense mode, big defense mode. Um, and basically, Adele won by defending for a very long time. So it looks like Tristan is actually not going to be doing any of that. And we can already see how far ahead Tristan's getting just in terms of the big unit counts. Now, to be entirely honest, people will look at this situation and go, Wait a minute, this isn't fair. In control, did, he's made these two warp gates. He hasn't really made anything out of them. And looking at this Nexus, he's expanding. It's not fair to compare this army to this army because this should be a lot bigger. Well, okay, if that's the case, and that's actually a very good point, and not a lot of people do that, but the people who do do it feel super smug with themselves, right? They, they, they consider what um, th the best way it could have been and say, well, then you would have lost, because if he was playing as best as he would have, he would have had so many more units, but what they don't actually do is explicitly calculate how many more units that would be. So, for instance, if this Nexus were gone and this Simulator were gone, that is 475. So that is about four Zealots. Let's actually uh, be very generous with him and say two Zealots and two Stalkers. You can still see how, he, how far behind he's going to uh, be against this, uh, or excuse me, against this count. I mean, he'd have five zealots, he'd have six stalkers, but he's against eight and thirteen. Or what if these two warp gates were not made? Well, if those two warp gates were not made, that's an extra 150 that he could have spent on units, okay? Or excuse me, another 300 he could have spent on units, 150 each. Oh, wow, yeah, still not really getting that many. As we can see, Tristan is actually getting just a lot more units because he's just constantly producing them, chrono boosting them, and opting to get this expansion up earlier. That is pretty cool to see that actually happen. And this is what's making me excited, is I'm kind of going, well, if you can go two gate and pressure, you can really analyze whether you can just expand and then four gate. And Tristan, I think, is, um... You know, I, I actually talked to Tristan quite a bit. Uh, he's actually the person who I got the phrase quite a bit from. He says that, like, all the time. And, um... In watching him play, a lot of the... One of the big consistent patterns that I see him do is that he, he'll just kind of attack. And, I mean, even when I'm, you know, talking to him about a game on Skype, he'll just say, yeah, I had no idea whether I should have attacked, so I just kind of went for it. And, you know, it's kind of funny because there's a lot of replays he'll send me where he'll, like, attack and lose everything and kill, like, three food worth of stuff. And that just looks terrible, and I'm like, ooh, maybe you shouldn't attack there. But what's kind of funny is that, like, I actually really like watching his games because he just has these really nice attack timings sometimes where things work out very, very well. Like, in this spot... Just sort of moving out when he haphazardly had a pretty decent 4-gate production, and he was able to shut down this expansion from a player who was trying to get a Colossus pretty damn fast, who even had um, this range upgrade. Little things like that. No, Tristan. Very bad, Tristan. Um, little things like that. Obviously want to work on that. But, you know, look at how impressive this is. Moving in for the attack, killing the expansion, and then calmly backing all the way out again. I cannot tell you how... Many people do this, including me. You kill off the expansion, he's forced to retreat, and you retreating yourself is, like, never even considered as a possibility. Like, never. But honestly, on one of these maps, or actually on any map where it's very, very hard to reinforce or to keep bolstering an attack, pulling back can be a pretty reasonable thing to do if you've done some guaranteed damage. You've killed the expansion, you haven't lost any units, you have done guaranteed damage... And there, the plus one attack is getting itself done. Nothing but Zealots and Stalkers. This is also quite key with a style like this. These two Gas Geysers, uh, this one actually has just gotten guys mining in it. This one has apparently only had one mining in it. As we can see, it's almost all Stalkers and Zealots and very, very light on the sentries. Very, very light on the sentries. Now, in the Adele Scott Huck game, in that game... What we saw is that Adele Scott basically just attacked at this point and approximately won. Uh, Huck held on for a little bit longer because he's Huck and he can do that, but um, that was basically that. So this becomes a very important question, and this is this is the crippling period. So for any of you who are like platinum level or even like gold level, I know I know you do this. You do, you don't know what it is that you do because I haven't told you yet, but I know you do it, and I'm going to tell you. It's where you have um, 
a, a, some early thing you're trying to do. So, for example, in this case, let's say you were your mantra in this case, you're Tristan, and you're trying to expand to your natural, uh, and you're trying not to die to any early pressure. So you two gated him well. You got your four gateways up very early on. You got these four gateways up. You defended, and then you're like, "Yeah, I did it." And then this happens. You go, uh, oh, what do I do now? And that is probably the, the most terrible feeling in the world. You've been losing to the Four Warp Gate, losing to the Colossus. And you finally get your strategy going. You go, yes! And you're alive. You have your probes making. You're hitting that E button. Like, yeah, yeah hitting it with that finger, you know. And then you lose because you have no sense of what's going on next. And that's what I thought was very sweet about this game, is what was going on in the next step. Now, in the early game logic, in the small army logic, the reason what Tristan's doing works is because Colossi are not very good in small numbers. One or two Colossi, not so good. Four or five Colossi? almost impossible to deal with. With the small numbers of Colossus, you can have just Stalkers and Zealots dealing the damage and you're okay. But I really love the way that uh, Tristan begins transition. Just briefly note that Tristan is about 40 food ahead. About 40 food ahead. Really, really, really high. And he's spreading his units out in control, tries to poke forward, pulls back very intelligently. Uh, some of the Stalkers decide to do their own thing. Stalkers apparently are in fact related to the Dragoon, which for any of you who didn't play Brood War is the dumbest unit ever programmed in a video game. Now this is interesting to me. I thought Tristan was getting an Immortal. For any of you people who play like In Control does, who get uh, the relatively fast Colossus, what you'll see is they will sometimes get an Immortal to deal with any sort of crazy scary stalker pushes. So I thought Tristan was getting an Immortal because he was just feeling a little bit scared. However, we're slowly going to see that this is totally awesome. Now anytime I see an attack that's just sort of happening, um... Uh, without any real obvious timing. For In Control, it was a seemingly obvious timing. Third Colossus just finished. So for this, I'm asking, is plus one getting close? No, plus one isn't really close. I'd probably wait a little bit longer. Uh, attacking and expanding at the same time. Good RTS logic. That's going to be super awesome in a moment. Advancing forward, just pulling back. Stalkers can do that. You can poke with a big stalker army. You go, whoops, and just back away again. Just be aware of where the sentries are so you don't get force fielded. So here comes uh, a standard Tristan-style attack. He's just attacking. Just gonna go for the attack. Do it. Yeah. And these immortals kind of get stuck behind. Haven't really been able to participate. But this is good, pulling these stalkers up. Trying to let these ones wrap around. Uh, Tristan is just trying to hammer him with a whole bunch of units. But again, Colossi start to get real tough to deal with when you get a lot, 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 lot of them. So Tristan is running up in this direction. I like this because it was the safest path, but also because it's the farthest away from his brand new expo and all the rest of his units coming in. Um, so just pulling all the rest of this stuff back. Uh, still still having a little bit of a lead, still about 20 food ahead. Tristan's armor upgrade should have just finished. Yep, there's the armor going down, but Colossi are actually a little bit faster than those slower units like the Immortal and the Zealot. They can just barely catch up as we'll see. We'll, we'll occasionally get a shot off. But in control, doing or excuse me, Tristan doing some sort of funky counterattack, and this is the the part where I was kind of like, oh Tristan, you know, like oh, oh man, because okay, so this counterattack, I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of this was. Um, I I jested with him about this, but I want you to just get to this game state with me because I think everyone can agree that little counterattack was perhaps not the best idea. That this little attack could have been pulled back uh, maybe a little bit earlier. But if we look at the unit counting station, alas, Tristan is actually behind on food. He's five food behind going to the unit station. It looks like Tristan does have a few extra probes. Actually, has 15 extra probes, which I shouldn't say is a few. That's actually a lot of extra probes. And Control does have an incredibly scary army, though. But what's Tristan going for? He's going for that key charge upgrade and soon blink. And by getting that Twilight Council, also going for upgrades. And I'm just going to keep this resource menu open because I want to just demonstrate how this build is going to let Tristan get ahead. Because he has all those extra probes, and because he has the good RTS general game sense, he actually played Warcraft 2 competitively. Warcraft this many. Warcraft 2. We're playing Starcraft 2. It went like Warcraft 2, and then Star, and then Diablo, I think, and then Starcraft, and then the expansion, and then like Diablo 2, and then World of Warcraft, and then World of Warcraft, and then like another World of Warcraft, and then Starcraft 2 back when you could only select nine units at a time. Oh! 
So he has that good RTS sense, right? He has the good RTS sense to have expanded here. But I just want you to note the, the difference in production capacity. This has pretty much uh, been making the Colossi nonstop, and these gateways are getting used half frequently. But the fact that this macro style of play allows him to get so many probes, he can actually constantly produce out of these gateways much more easily than this uh, slightly more passive, big, scary army style. Now, I'm not trying to say that what In Control's doing is bad by any means. In fact, that's why this replay is was so interesting to me, is that In Control did a lot of very good decision-making in this game and is pretty much doing what you do with Protoss. Big Colossus getting some Stalkers. Some players prefer to get the second Robo and just go all Zealot Colossus. But this is very, very interesting to me. And the one thing that I, I remember actually specifically saying to Tristan, dude, you shouldn't get those Immortals. You should just be getting Stalkers with Blink. Because then you can get even more Gateways, man. I'm totally thinking like a Brood War player, right? Like, just build some extra things that can build things, man. That is the way that you play that game. In Control, look, look at how smartly In Control is playing, warping things in. Has seven Colossi, is starting to upgrade stuff of his own. Has Tristan hit the two upgrade? I'm curious if he... No, he's not really going to hit that. But is spreading his stuff out very smartly. And here comes the big attack. Now, I just want you to note, remember when Tristan fell behind? Well, now he has pulled himself back ahead. He's 20 food ahead. And going to the resource counting station, most of what Tristan had been making was units. A lot of Zealots, a lot of Stalkers, and a decent amount of Immortals. Almost has Blink done. Well, it's, it's effectively done, because it's going to be done for this battle. And I have slowed it down to the normal speed. I'm not going to turn on any health bars yet, so it doesn't confuse the positioning. Uh, but the Zealot's doing a good job of running up. And look at the Colossi shooting all the Zealots underneath. The, uh, but there's just, like, so much stuff. And these Immortals getting in the front are just going to eat up the Stalkers. Just absolutely crush all these Stalkers beyond belief. And I was actually pretty blown away at how effective these Immortals ended up being. And in control, again, doing smart things, pulling back to this backside, trying to attack as much from the high ground as he can. Now, if you're pulling back, you're doing the stop and shoot micro. As Noni says, you have to let the animation of the Colossus actually deal damage, because if it fires and you immediately move back, it doesn't actually hurt anything. So be careful about that. But looking at these Immortals, these Immortals did a lot of damage. Look at that. Six kills, seven kills, two kills. Almost all those were armored units. Few zealots got taken out right at the very outset, but it, this is an interesting little mix to me um, because I would have thought that zealots with uh, charge and the stalkers with blink um, would have been a little bit more uh, of a strong mix as an exclusive combo because the immortals are obviously way slower than everything. But blink and charge can be used more as maneuverability tactics for you to get into good spots, as we'll see in a little bit. And then Tristan kind of attacking again. Uh, he just held off an attack. Uh, might be a good time to attack, might not be. But either way, setting up to expand while he attacks. This is kind of one of these funny things that you'll end up seeing, is that, like, um, th th that's like the, the RTS player logic versus the experienced StarCraft II player logic. Because a lot of times the experienced StarCraft II player will look at the situation and go, I should not attack here. I will lose. But a lot of times, that good RTS player logic says, well, if you attack and expand at the same time, it's probably going to be good, right? So, so look, just setting up for that. And that's kind of a funny thing that ends up happening, um, is that, like, Tristan, I think we can... I think In Control's had much better attack timing in this game. Oh, by the way, that blink was awesome. Trist I think In Control's had much better attack timing in this game. But, you know, Tristan just keeps expanding and keeps making probes and is setting up to do more expanding, so that's good. So here comes this in-battle stuff. Uh, the in-battle positioning. Sure, the Immortals get caught behind, but hey, there's a nice little blink up to that top side. Got to be very careful with the Immortals. They are super vulnerable to those sentries, but Tristan's trying really hard to get up there and actually take out these Colossi, and he is able to take out some Colossi pretty impressively with these uh, other units, the Immortals, the Stalkers. Um, I'm curious about, at this stage, getting a Warp Prism for the Immortals. Um... And to be entirely honest, I was very surprised the first time I saw Tristan win that battle. I was very surprised. Very, 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 very surprised. So I'm actually going to go back and I want to see exactly how this happens. And this is this is why I was a little bit shocked. Okay, so look at all these units. 
at the top that I have highlighted with the help. All the, the highlighted units are going to die pretty damn fast. And this is five Colossi. Five of them. And this is, again, a lot, a lot of credit to the Immortals as a unit. Watch all these units at the top just evaporate. Everything just roasts up. The Zealots are also doing a lot of damage. Did you actually see all the Zealots that were able to charge up there and do the serious pain bringing? This army... Again, if I'm Tristan here, I retreat here almost every time. I'm not giving enough credit to the blink and to the charge. But here are our Zealots that we have highlighted again. The Zealots target firing here. The Immortals target firing here. The Stalkers target firing that top one. Yeah, look, three get taken out. I don't necessarily think you should have just your Zealots targeting one, just your Stalkers targeting one, and just your Immortals targeting one, but we can see that kind of like people use Marauders to pick off Colossi, you can use a lot of low-tech units as Protoss to pick off opposing Protoss opponents' Colossi. Um, and Immortals that, all, you know, on paper just seem so good against those uh, uh, Colossi. Look at that, 60 damage with those two upgrades. Note they do get plus 5 damage per level 1 upgrade. So Tristan, of course, <laughs> happily going to level 3. But I'm just so amazed at how much damage that can do. Just the upgrades plus... Um, upgrades plus just general base units continuing to get the, uh... Well, I just want to distinguish between upgrades and then, like, abilities. Uh, getting upgrades for your basic units and improving them by getting their abilities, namely the charge lot and the blink. It's been very, very, very effective, as we can clearly see. And, I mean, in control, trying to expand, getting the usual stuff up. But the Colossus was really that key piece, and just having so much stuff. Just, it's, it was very, very weird to me to see this work so well, so I just want more people to begin to try this basic opening of doing the sort of gentle two gate, trying to pick off probes, expanding, and then relying on a little bit more low tech of an army. Tristan um, is getting Dark Templar. This is another thing that he says to me that he does sometimes. He's just like, I didn't know if getting Dark Templar was good, but I just kind of got him. And as we can see, it's, it seems to be working out pretty well. At the very least, it's sweet. And there's the good game. Hey, that's pretty, pretty neat. And this honestly happens to me a lot when I'm watching um, just random people's streams. Just I, I watch a lot of streams. I don't know if you know this, but on Team Liquid, where it says, like, featured streams, sure, you know, I'll tune into Gretorp and Sen and people who are really good play. But if you go to, like, the non-featured streams and you watch one of them, you can sometimes get some great ideas. And this game, I no offense to Tristan, no offense... Because In Control is a professional player and does this all the time. I think In Control is all around a better player. In Control plays this a lot. He coaches people a lot. He has a lot of experience. But it was very, very weird to me to see that in this game, Tristan was just pulling ahead. And then when he screwed up, he just pulled ahead. Out of no huge mistakes that In Control necessarily made. Um, and it worked out pretty well. And whenever I see that, I go, huh, maybe people aren't doing this matchup right. There's a lot of truth to the way that um, Tristan was playing that game. So I thought that was cool. I was into that. And I'll definitely take some questions because that is the structure of the Day 9 Daily. Yes, I finished. I finished at 7.40 today. 7.40. That means I can take questions for 10 minutes and it'll be about 45 minutes long. Yeah. Let's do it. Hmm. Awesome. So let's see here. Um, dum -da dum 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 dum. Aha! Snake Chomp, who has an awesome ID. My glasses have broke. There is the remainder of my glasses. I will piece these back together. I don't even know why I, I try to have them fit. They fit pretty well with just one one arm, but uh, I like the symmetry of it. <laughs> so the the question that Snake Chomp says it says if I do not know what I'm looking for. Should I still scout my opponent's base at the start of the game? What are some ways I can figure out what I'm looking for? Um, so I want people... Because okay, so there's two, two parts I'm going to answer. First, of, first off, if you're not looking for anything, don't scout. Just don't. Um, you can do something like what Huck does, which is send a really early scout to harass. But in general... If you're not scouting for something, then don't scout. scout some sort of, oh, I'm just, oh, I'm just scouting, just, just scouting, just hanging out, scouting. Like, don't, no, no, very bad. So, um, the ways that you can figure out what you're looking for is to start noting when you win and when you lose. 
Really, 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 really simple stuff. For me, when I was doing early expanses Protoss, I've been using this example a lot, I was losing an awful lot to Cloaked Banshees. He would just get a Cloaked Banshee in there, and I'd go, oh, I don't have a robotics facility. Shucks. But I crush everything else. Yeah, any early push, I would smash. I would smash the two barracks pushes. I would smash the tank marine pushes. I was feeling mighty. Um, and I still had to figure out how to deal with um, early expands. So, what am I looking for now? Is he doing a big aggressive early push, which I'm happy about, which I know I can hold off? Is he going for really fast Banshees? Or is he going for some sort of early expand? Because if he's going for the early expand, I don't need to make so much. I don't need to prepare like I'm holding off some big scary push. So then, based upon knowing that I was losing a lot to the Banshees and not losing a lot to the other things, I would say something like, well, if I'm making five gateways after I expand, Maybe I should just make that four gateways and in a robotics facility uh, if I think he's going Banshee. And then what I start doing is I start scouting him just, again, to try to identify if he is doing that thing that I lose to. Don't lose track of what you are beating, though. It's very easy to overcompensate. It's very easy to be like, I will go one gate, two robotics facility to get as many observers as I can, and then you just you have two robotics facilities, so you lose. Um, but again... Make sure that you know what you're beating, make sure you know what you're losing to, and then scout for that. The second thing I wanted to say is you need to start scouting the front. And I don't mean, um, it sounds obvious because it's like where else would I go into, but people want to get into the main. They want to get observers, they want to get speed overlords or overseers, they want to scan in there. Really, to be entirely honest, getting to see inside someone's base is an exclusively Terran privilege. Terran get to scan. Terran just says, I want to see that, and then they scan it. <sighs> For Protosses and Zergies, really what you want to be doing is trying to count what you see at the front of your base. Very simple example. If I am doing my early expand build, which is the one that everyone's doing nowadays, which is one gate, core, and then I, I throw down an expansion around 30, but I go Zealot, Stalker, Stalker, or sometimes Zealot, Stalker, Expand. But if I push with that first Zealot and that first Stalker, if I'm right about to get to his base and I send a probe up, a scouting probe, and I see that he has one Marines and two Marauders, I know for a fact that he made a barracks with one Marine, then made the tech lab add-on, and then made two Marauders. I know that to be true. I'm not getting into his base. I'm not seeing anything. But I'm seeing at his front, I'm getting a count of his units. The Zealot and the Stalker are there to draw those units to the front. Because if I just scouted with a probe and one marine was there, he could be hiding those two marauders. But I move with a probe, a stalker, and a, a zealot, because that'll make them go, oh, crap, and then he'll pull them to the front. Or, you know, if you're Terran and you're doing some reaper openings, and you're counting the number of roaches he has, you can kind of go, oh, if he has seven roaches, I know he couldn't have possibly afforded zergling speed as well. So I don't have to worry about zergling speed for a little bit. Um, counting what you can see at the front to make judgments about the back, really important. The only way you're going to do that is by looking at replays. You look at a replay and say, uh huh, he went for fast banshees and he only had one marine at this point. What point was that? Oh, it's right when I took my second geyser. Oh, I guess every time I take a second geyser, I should send a probe to see if he has more than one marine. If I see one, probably going banshees. If I see ten, probably not going banshees. Done. Now I know something to scout for. But again, scouting at the front. Super, super important. Scouting at the front. Um, so, Watsonator says, Dear Day 9, I understand the importance of upgrades in any matchup, especially in the late game, but do you feel that upgrades in mirror matchups are even more of a necessity? Um, first of all, I would, I would say something like that comparison doesn't matter. That comparison doesn't matter because you think of Protoss vs. Zerg, Differently than you think of Protoss vs. Terran, differently than you think of Protoss vs. Protoss. Um, I wouldn't say mirrors versus non-mirrors. I would just say, how. what is the most correct way to play this one matchup? And interestingly, upgrades are very tough in mirrors. Um, for any of you who are having uh, an excess of difficulty in the mirror matchups uh, with upgrades, that's very normal. Because this is what happens. You go 4-gate, I go 3-gate with a forge to get an upgrade, and you just kill me before that upgrade happens. Yeah. So you see a lot of people who will um, get, like, 6 gates before a forge because they just need the units because if anyone who backs off first dies. You can do, you can do more clever things like get good Colossus defense set up. 
um, so that you can get away with getting an upgrade. But um, I would say it's just a lot of a concern. But I would just say don't group them up and just say mirror matchups like this, mirror matchups not like that. Uh, scrolling down, scrolling down. Um, let's see, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. Um, oh, the big toy says, Day 9, I would describe what Tristan did. Um, let's see. Um, I would describe what Tristan did as breaking the four-gate dead... I'm going to reword that sentence. So I, I talked a lot about the, the four-gate deadlock, where you're going four-gate, and the only thing I can defend with is by me going four-gate. And the big toy is saying, I would describe what Tristan did is just by out-macroing it. That it was just a big macro focus. I would actually say that what Tristan did is try to put pressure on the foregate before it could get off the ground in that vulnerable period. Um, because I think there are a couple very common ways to foregate. The most common way to foregate is to make two or three units out of the gateway and then just spend all the rest of your money building the extra gateways and chrono boosting the warp gates and then right after you get the warp gate that's when you go from three to like seven and ten like really fast uh but tristan just got a, a zealot in there and really started attacking um attacking the probes i think you guys need the zealot visual aid really started to get in there and mess with the probes and in particular if you're in control and you see that there um is two gates done and both of them are making zealots you go, whoa, I can't just chrono boost warp gate and start building four warp gates right away. I gotta make guys. And in this game, as we saw, warp gate was about done, I think, when uh, in control had to make all the extra. Or when Tristan made, or when in control made all the extra warp gates. I'm pretty sure his warp gate upgrade was done. I'm just gonna let this run for a brief period. Um, but, you know, I actually just want to re-reveal that idea of, of picking off the foregate before it even starts. By looking at in-control's money, see, here's the here's the core going down, and then all of a sudden, holy crap, there's a zealot rush coming. All right, let me make that. And then here's a very fast second gateway. And now making the stalker. Chrono boosting it really hard, trying to make a little wall off. Now, uh, is he going to be making more units? He should be. Uh, there's another Stalker coming up. And there's two Stalkers coming up. Now, notice, Warp Gate ordinarily would be started by now and would be approaching completion. But look at how broken Control is. He can't afford to make more Gateways. He can't afford to do that. Because look, now all of a sudden... All of a sudden, oh yeah, oh, this is kind of scary. So in a sense, it's not that Tristan is out-macroing uh, in Control. It's more that... Tristan was forcing in control to make a whole bunch of units at the start. Uh, and the four warp gate couldn't really get off the ground. So, let's see here. Um, I'm going to take one more question. I'm going to take one more question. Ah. I'm out of water. I'm sad. Okay, let's take this question by Dunsford, because I think that's a cool thing to say, Dunsford. Day 9, a two-gate opening typically puts you behind on probe count. If Tristan wouldn't have taken out probes with his initial zealots, would his build still worked? Um, I mean, my, my gut instinct is, yeah. My gut instinct is, probably shouldn't actually take out... Well, to be honest, you can probably kill... Um, you can always really kill some probes, at the very least. You can you can almost always do damage. But the idea is, I killed one or two probes with this one zealot. Was that worth it? That's the real underlying question. And I still think that that's, that works out okay. But, um... I... There, there's just other advantages that I see to this build. This build isn't just a probe killer. This build is... A lot about putting your opponent on the back foot. Because, I mean, just, like, even coming to, like, this part in the game where in control just tried to do a little bit of a... Or he went up here to try to do a push. Had to pull back away again. And if we just look in in control's main, if we just go to the in control cam... Uh, yeah, see, he's making these extra gateways way, way late. And we can even see out of these, we see some sentries making for defense... Um, oh my god, and he sees he sees another big push coming. 
Oh my god, Ink Control just got done holding off the first push. And he, is there another push really coming? Well, in reality, Tristan's actually just about to expand. Tristan's just poking around here, sees a lot of stalkers, says, Nah, I don't really care to try to break that. And we can even see some more zealots getting made here. You can see Chrono Boost being spent on that. Warp Gate's finally getting close to finishing, and now in control is kind of like, okay, okay, breather, breather. I'm actually going to stay alive. I'm actually going to be able to defend this. Alright, cool. Robo. So, I mean, you can see that in control is just in such a defensive mindset, and this is really something that we talk about a lot, but people don't really internalize it and let it soak up. The idea that if you are the attacker, you have a lot of benefits. A lot of benefits. Your expansions are more secure if you are the attacker. Um, you get to see what he is doing more often when you're the attacker. Because he has to reveal all his units to stay alive. You could be moving up with um, a small force that you're always going to be pulling back with. But a lot of times he'll bring a lot of those units to the front that you can see. He will make defenses to try to hold off your push, and then you just won't push. So he's wasted money on defenses you're never going to attack. All big advantages that you get as the aggressor. And I was trying to really find a good way to go um, for a two-gate, and I think that Tristan's found a nice balance as I continue to drop my pencil on the floor. And it's a nice balance because... Damn it. <laughs> it's a nice balance because with most two-gate-y stuff, uh, like two gate zealot right off the bat, you're just so late on the stalkers that a player like Kiwi Kaki will happily micro three stalkers to kill hundreds of zealots. So that doesn't feel so good. Um, but yeah, in general, I just like builds where you can attack, you can push, and you can elect to pull back because you get those nice boosts. So no, I don't think it was all about the probes. There's a lot of other cool things there. And you can check them out too. Ba -na -na. I'm going to go. Submit your replays to day9monday at gmail.com. We're going to be doing Fun Day Monday. No Queen Zerg play tomorrow. Submit your replays. I might just choose yours. <gasps> See ya. Goodbye. I miss you already. Do, 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 do. Bum, ba, da, da. Where is my recording console? And stop.